it's a rainy night in Haleyville, and it may be a rainy night in Georgia. I think it's raining all over the world. Y'all remember that song? I know Sister Sherry does. I, we got two Sherry's in here, okay? Hey, Brother Wayne. And hey to you out there in Radio Land. And this is not WJBB in Haleyville, but this is S-O-L-I-D-R-O-C-K in Haleyville, Alabama. I would have been a good radio announcer, wouldn't I? No, I'm just kidding with you. But welcome, everybody, to very important night. This is midweek. This is the time I was always told you kind of get, get you over the hump. And what better way to get you over the hump in, during the week at midweek other than the Word of God? Amen? Amen. 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 Would you stand to your feet and pray with me right now? Father God, we just thank you that where two or more are gathered in your name, you are there in our midst. You are welcome here, Holy Spirit of God. We thank you for the power, the dudamous power of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for the authority, Lord God. We thank you for the power that you have given us to live this life to the full. We thank you that we are overcomers more than conquerors, and we can do all things through Christ Jesus, Lord. We thank you, God, that we're not the same anymore, that our walk daily is with you to live the overcoming life. And God, we speak faith. We live faith. We, we are, are powerful through faith in you, Lord. And so we thank you, Lord Jesus Christ. We worship you tonight as we gather here and we invite the presence of the Holy Spirit in this place tonight. In the name of the Lord Jesus, and somebody give him a shout of praise right now in this place. Amen. Amen. You can be seated in the presence of God, and I'm going to get right into the Word. But before I do, I, I'm just, I've, I've just been hearing this all day today of how important it is for us to live the overcoming life. And, and the, Word of, the Holy Spirit just kept drawing me back uh, to several scriptures, but the first one was, and I don't know if I'll get to the next or not. We're just going to follow the Holy Ghost. Is that okay? So as in Ezekiel chapter 37, you we've heard this and heard this and heard this. It's kind of like we hear 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray, repent, seek my face, then I will hear from heaven and I will hear, heal their land. Never before in my lifetime have we ever needed a healing in our land right now. I mean, some of the woke stuff going on right now, and I cannot believe the, the news media of actual facts. What we thought was conspiracy theory uh, is actually truth now that's coming out in Congress, even as, as, as I speak today, that it's happening. And, uh, you know, we, we do not need to live in a country and sit back and do nothing uh, when people that have done high treasonous things from our president, uh, some of his uh, relatives and all, and then just get a pardon for it. I mean, my Lord, my God. You know, I was reading in the Word of the Lord today on how that the wicked could not stand among the righteous. Uh, how that God, yes, loves all people, but how that when a nation uh, is ruled by the righteous, a nation rejoices. But when they are ruled by the wicked, and then people are, are d disparaged and they're depressed about that. So, uh so just pray for me tonight. I want to share this word with you real quickly. We get right into the lesson. And one more thing. I, I called to talk to someone I kind of sort of made friends with in the state of Washington, not Washington, D.C., and come to find he was a believer, follower of Jesus. I was placing a personal order uh, with this man. And a uh, young man uh, sounded like to be possibly around 40, 38, 40-ish and all. And so we got to talking, and, and uh, I said, tell me how it is out in the state of Washington, and where do you live? And he lived about two hours uh, from Seattle. And he said, hey, he said, hey, brother, you really need to pray for us in Washington. He said, this has begun, begun to be such a woke state here. 
And a lot of our freedoms, our constitutional freedoms have been taken and stolen from us. Actually, the Second Amendment, part of the Second Amendment right now, if not a large part of the Second Amendment, he said that they have already passed law there. Now, this, ha this has happened in other states in America. And don't you think, unless you're going to do what Ezekiel is saying here, that it couldn't happen here. And I'm not here as, as a, a prophet of doom or anything like that, but just a preacher that preached the truth, okay? We need to know the truth. We don't need to be like ostriches and hide our heads in the sand or stick our heads in our seat or in in a hole somewhere these things are actually happening but we can do something about it but the great news is this is that in the midst of a darkness when a little light begins to shine among God's people and they begin to speak God's word into that darkness all of a sudden there's a great light that begins to shine and God exposes wickedness does away with wickedness and the righteous rule again in a nation that is God's kingdom active and alive can somebody say amen are you with me so make a long story short with the state of Washington my friend now he in Washington he tells me that nobody anymore period unless this is retracted, but right now it's law. The governor signed it, and it's law. You cannot buy a, a military-style weapon. And I'm not talking about fully automatic weapon. I'm talking about basically the AR-15 semi-automatic rifle or an AK-47 or any kind of look-alike or any high-capacity magazine. And then the law states, he told me just a little bit about it, the law states then, if you own one, they're going to grandfather you in right now, but you have to register it if it's not registered. And then if, if, if you die or pass on, you have got to leave that to someone in your family and that they have to register that as well with the federal government. It has to be a transfer. Now, ask yourself this question. Why in the world would a woke government want to take your AR-15s. And I know, uh, you know, you hear me talk a lot about guns, and I love guns, but guns here uh, keeps, uh, and I know God is our shield and our protector, but he's also told us to use our faith and be active in our faith, and we have the God-given constitutional uh, that's been given to us by God himself, and we have the right to protect ourselves even against a uh, a, a godless government just like England was that tried to take over the people and control them and become a dictatorship. So what would they go for? They would go for those kind of weapons. And the sad thing is this, is that law-abiding citizens are the ones that are losing here. Law-abiding citizens are not people that shoot people, that kill people. I mean, that's the truth. And guns don't kill people. It is sick people that kill people that need Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. So let me jump right into this. So I'm reading uh, Ezekiel th chapter 37. God just kept speaking that to me today. And I want to read just a little bit of it to you. Uh, it said, the hand of the Lord came upon me. And I want to ask you a question. When was the last time the hand of the Lord came on you? Because, see, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, the Holy Spirit, is here. And if we have that kind of a relationship with, the God, with God Almighty on a daily basis, the hand of the Lord is on you and I to do His will and to bring about what He desires in, in this country and our nation. So Ezekiel says that the hand of the Lord came upon me and He brought me out uh, in the spirit of the Lord. Now, he didn't knock Ezekiel out, but he brought him into the presence of, of, his, of, of himself and of the Spirit of the Lord. And then he said, he set me down in the midst of a valley, and it was full of dry bones. And you, You've all heard this, but I want you to hear with those ears tonight, and I want you to catch this. And then he caused me to pass by them all around. And behold, there were very many in the open valley and indeed, they were very dry. In other words, these people were lifeless. Well, we are walking around 
in a majority of a lifeless society. The, 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 we, we, you know, we have to make this Word of God, the Word of God, the Bible, very current to our life today. Uh, because it, it, it's for every generation. It is for us now. We see so many lifeless people in our culture today. And did you know just two weeks ago, a new statistical information that was released, and, and this is proven to be a fact, back in during the Billy Graham days, uh, Christianity in America, it was something like 73 to 74 percent of Americans profess Christianity in America, okay? And so that only left about 20-something percent of people that did not or that they confessed some other type of, I'm going to say, false religion because that's what it is. But today, only two weeks ago, I want you to listen to this. See, these are figures that we don't like to hear in a church service because we, I, I do believe that we come in to worship Jesus, number one. We lift up the name of Jesus Christ, and we're here to build one another up in our most holy faith according to the Word of God and to encourage and edify one another, okay? So I believe all that. But also at the same time, rightly dividing the Word of truth, we have to speak truth. But as of two weeks ago, the, here's what the figures show now, that it was like 30 something percent like i think it was like 36 37 percent of americans claim to be christians and 60 something like 69 percent of america now uh don't claim to be anything and in that category you will find atheist and uh uh all other kinds of false religions so when we read this about ezekiel and he, God shows him in this vision, this open valley, and many, he said, many in this valley, indeed, they were dry. They were like dead people. They had no life in them. Now listen carefully. And then Ezekiel said, God said to me, son of man, you are a son or a daughter of God. So this mandate is for you and I as well. He said, can these bones live? So I answered, so I answered God Almighty, uh, Lord, you know, you know if these bones can live. See, Ezekiel was seeing his own people in that valley of dry bones. And then he said to me, uh, Lord, after he said, Lord, you know if they can live or not. And then he said to Ezekiel again, God, prophesy, speak the word to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord. See, the only thing that will resurrect a person out of a dry, dead, wilderness experience life where there seems to be no life at all is if they can receive the spoken word of God is the only thing that will get other people's attention and that will draw them into a life of real life and of the overcoming life. Do you agree with me? Say amen. amen. But, but listen to what he says. He says prophesy. In other words, he said, I want you to speak to these bones. Is it hot in here? Well... All somebody has to do, excuse me, you, you folks on Facebook, all you got to do is we'll just walk right over here because I'm getting hot up here, but I don't know if it was because of the preaching or what. But we're going to get some cool air going in here because I don't want nobody. I want everybody to keep your clothes on in here, okay? Keep your clothes on, but clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ. But notice he says prophesy. In other words, he said, I want you to speak to this situation, you know, that speaks volumes to me. It speaks about the importance of prayer. It speaks the importance about speaking the Word of God, believing the Word of God in your heart, and speaking the Word of God into the dryness, into the people. And, and let me tell you something. Winston County, with about 132 churches right now, we are still in the same shape 
as it was when God gave me that vision in 2018. There's still, and I'll back off a thousand. I will back off a thousand to just give, you know, room for a little bit of error on my part. But there's at least 16,000 people in a county, less than 24,000 people that possibly do not know Christ, that are definitely not in church on Sunday. And you, if you are a born-again Christian, you are to be in church. You will want to go to church on Sunday. You will want to be in a corporate worship service. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired of people saying, well, I can live without going to a church. I'm going to tell you something. You ain't going to live the overcoming life out of the presence of a corporate worship service at a church house somewhere. It is the truth. It's the absolute truth. So, Ezekiel was speaking, and he said, So I prophesied as I was commanded of the Lord. We are commanded of the Lord to be a witness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's to the people in our sphere, okay? Okay? Some people don't do it because they feel like, well, you know, I'm not called to be an evangelist, so he's really not talking about me. You know, somebody told me an amazing thing in a council session of how well they were doing now because they got back into the Word of God. I mean, this person is on fire. I wish they were here tonight, but they were on fire. Within a period of about two weeks, their whole life has been turned around. And you know what the difference was? They said, Pastor, I just stopped listening to TV preachers. Now, I'm not against these people, and don't hear me wrong and go out here and tell everybody, Pastor Benny's against everybody that's on TV, and that's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying that at all. But you won't get the same thing. Well, let me tell you this. You won't get the power of God in your life to do what God has called you to do unless your face is in the book. Unless your face is in the book and you're reading the Word of God. I'm going to tell you something. When I was kind of lethargic and, and uh, on my own choosing, how many ever been through this? The devil's all over this to give you lethargy that, hey, I've worked hard today, I've been out all day, I don't feel like reading my Bible, much less getting up at 5 o'clock in the morning and reading the Word of God, even though David said that's what he did. He got up early to meet with God. That's a good, great example for us to do. But if you don't, then there's nothing wrong in the evening to at least get a little Word of the God in you before you go to bed. So the Word is so important in our lives. Do you agree with that? Say amen. Well, see... We have, uh, it, so the, 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 the trick of the devil is this. Well, I just don't feel like it, but at least I can lay back on the couch and turn on a little tube and listen to a good preacher. Now, I'm not saying that all that's wrong, but you be the judge of that in your own conscience because when I do that, usually... It's not really the Holy Spirit speaking to me, and the next thing you know, I'm just going to sleep. How many has ever done that before? I just go out to sleep. But when I get my face in the book, and I ask the Holy Spirit to guide me and to lead me, and speak to me, Lord, speak to me. What is it that you want me to hear, and what is it that you want me to do today in my life? Is there anything wicked in my life today that I need to repent of? And usually there's something that I have to repent of. How about you? So Ezekiel says he prophesied as he was commanded. He did what God told him to do. And as he prophesied, there was a noise. You see, when we begin to speak with the authority of God's Word, there's going to be a noise following. There's a noise following. And that noise is the praises of people getting saved, number one. The reason to speak is to bring deliverance and salvation to a dead, dry people. And we have many of them. You know, my prayer for I don't know how long now is God fill this place up with new people that do not know you. That do not know you. So that they can be born again of the Spirit of God 
and that they can be filled, been baptized in the Holy Spirit, and can be baptized in water. I hope we have so many people, I can't baptize them all. I hope we have so many people that I have to call on everyone in here to help counsel and, and also make disciples and making disciples. Let me put it, I know I'm going here and there, but I'm hearing the voice of God right now. Making disciples is this. You get yourself, it's not a hard feat. It's not. You get yourself in the Gospels and whatever Jesus said in the Gospels for those disciples to do, then you teach these new converts. That's what you're supposed to do. And here's how you do it. Amen. I know I'm preaching to the choir tonight, but I'm feeling good about it. So Ezekiel, to end this up, he, he prophesied, he began seeing connections made again. Things begin to come together. And see, that's what needs to happen within our country. We need to come together, not for the sake of coming together. There is so many people in the body of Christ and leaders in the body of Christ that's wanting to come together for the sake of getting together with other churches, pastors, and preachers and, and other Christians. But that's not the mandate of God. You know, like to take back the city or to take back a nation or take back this country. That's not the mandate of God. When we begin to prophesy to dead lives in our society and we, we're responsible for our sphere, whoever it is that's around us, our neighbors, the people that we work with, you see, that's the principle of the New Testament. You first start at Jerusalem and then Samaria and then to the innermost parts of the world. But see, uh, most of the churches in America are still are still got this mentality that we're going to get together with a bunch of other churches and pastors and prophets and have an apostle over us all and we're going to take back and pull down these strongholds. I'm going to tell you something. All that does is to minister to the saints and they can do that every meeting in their own building. Amen? I mean, it's the truth. I didn't get no amen about that, so I guess you disagree with me on that. But that's all right. I'm not against getting together with other churches, but if that's the only mandate that you have, it's a wrong one. It's a wrong one. We're supposed to be about uh, the people of the harvest, to bring in the harvest and pray in the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the field to bring in the harvest. But as a whole, we're not doing that in America. I mean, it's the truth. So anyway, when... Ezekiel obeyed the Lord, things begin to connect. And see, we're not talking about connecting churches and ministries to each other. We're talking about, see, I've heard this, and I've studied this, and I've tried to be a part of this for years past, and it never worked. It never worked unless you had a leader that trained up the people that got together to go out and bring in the harvest. And some of these leaders, a few that I know, are really good at that. But a lot of people had rather come and receive than go and get. Amen? Okay, so Ezekiel prophesied. He obeyed the Lord. He spoke to these dried bones. They began to connect. There was not a connecting of other ministries or other prophets or other preachers of Ezekiel's day but they begin to connect with the Spirit of God as Ezekiel prophesied the Word of God over these dead lives. They begin to connect themselves to the Spirit of God. And all of a sudden, you know, it, and it talks about skin coming on and sinews and other things uh, in the, uh, sp uh, sp uh, the physical realm of a human body. But then out of that prophecy, a great army arose. A great army arose, a great army. And what better that we need right now in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is for a lot of dead lives out there to come in and be joined to the body of Christ, being born again of the Spirit of God and beginning a, to be a great army of God to rise up in this nation and take this country back for the kingdom of God. Amen? A great army of God that's not fearful of man, 
that speaks with courage and is brave and is not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, I don't know if I can. You know, how many times you've been in Walmart or anywhere? I don't care if it's goers or anywhere. And the Lord said, you know, you just need to speak to that person over there and, and, and I'll, I'll give you what to say. You don't have a clue what to say. And all of a sudden, the devil starts telling you so many reasons that you don't need to. And you're not qualified. You feel embarrassed. Oh, other people's looking at me. They're going to think I'm some kind of religious fanatic. I'm going to tell you, every time I do that and I obey the Spirit of God, there's, I don't care, it's been in Walmart, it's been in Gore's Big Star. Everywhere I go and that happens, people begin to come around and with tears in their eyes. I'm, I'm telling you, this is the truth. I've never not had this happen. And one or more people comes around and said, I'm sorry, sir, I don't know who you are, but I was on the other aisle and I heard you praying for that person and I'm telling you I need prayer in my life. I need God in my life and my kids need to be saved. Can you pray for me too? And see nobody, the manager at Walmart didn't come and say hey you can't do that here. Get out of here. Nobody told me anything like that. But the devil will lie to you and tell you don't do that. You're going to offend somebody. Listen, it's better to offend somebody with the word of God and be right is to not offend anybody at all. And my brother uh, Larry is here tonight. He just believes you're to offend somebody, at least one person every day. Amen? If you do it, if you do it with grace and love, that's the truth. Because a lot of people, uh, especially, you know, and, and I, I say religion, and I try to be careful here, because religion used to not be a bad word. It wasn't. It wasn't a bad word. We took that and made it into something that God did not mean it to be. Okay? Actually, he didn't call the, the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees religious people. He called them children of the devil. That's what he did. I mean, try to get by with that today. You are of your father the devil. But see, Jesus heard from the Holy Spirit. He did what the Father told him to do. And see, in telling those people that, did you know some of the priests and some of the Pharisees and Sadducees, according to the Word of God, came into the kingdom of God? And there might only been a few of them. The Bible only mentions a few names. But if he had not done that, those few would have not have been saved. They would all been lost. Amen. It's time to get into the lesson. I, I got one more. Got one more scripture. I got to obey the Lord. <clears throat> and at any time that I, I really feel in my heart that I'm out of the will of God tonight, I have an elder in here, and he has permission to stand up. And I know when he stands up and does this number here, I'm to change directions and repent of what I've done if I'm out of order. So I'm not going to excuse myself by saying, well, I'm just going to preach what I want to. I don't care what you think. I'm going to do it anyway. That is not following the Spirit of God. I beg your pardon. It's not. You have got to listen. So I won't obey the Spirit of God, and I mean that with all of my heart. I'm just going to say what Jesus said. And how many remember Mark 11, verse 22? This is so important. Sometimes we hear things for so long that it begins to be kind of mundane. But it needs to be active and alive because that's the, word, that's the Word of God. It's active. It's alive. It will do what it is set out to do if we will do our part. Jesus said, Mark, Mark 11, 22, have faith in God. And tonight I want to ask you, where is your faith tonight? For you that are watching by Facebook where is your faith tonight? Is it in the Democrats? I hope not. Is it in the rhino Republicans? I hope not. Is it in independence? Are you planning on Donald Trump turning this nation around? You, well, you're looking at men to do that. Now, I'm going to say this. Uh, you probably know now who I'm going to vote for and who I support, and I'm not ashamed of that. But first and foremost, our trust must be in the Lord our God, Jesus Christ, the only true and living God, number one. Amen. So do you have faith in God? 
Jesus is encouraging us, have faith in God. And that means this, that I am convinced, I am totally convinced that God will do what he said he'll do. That's what it means. For assuredly I say to you, Jesus said, whoever says, just like Ezekiel was speaking to a mountain, even though it was a valley. And God's word says, I will take you through the valley. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. But they needed a shepherd, and they needed a, a, a shepherd's heart of somebody that was a prophet or somebody that is a servant of Jesus today to speak to the mountain and speak to the valleys. God is in both places, in the valley and in the mountain. But we've got to speak. He said, whoever says to the mountain, and that is an obstacle that is keeping us out of the blessings of God and living the overcoming life, or whatever it is that the devil is using on you to taunt you. He said, speak to it and say, be removed and cast into the sea. And what that means here, casting into the sea, is when you go back and search the Word of God, it's talking about that basin that the priests watch, washed their faces in before they went in to the holy place. Not the holy of holies, but the holy place to prepare themselves, prepare the showbread, to light the menorah, and also to burn incense before God. They had to look in that, that mirror that water and wash their face. And James talks about it, about the washing of the water of the word as we look into the mirror. Have you ever read that in the book of James? As that you look in the mirror and, and some people look in the mirror and they turn away and they quickly forget who they are. And the reason they forget who they are is because they don't look into the real mirror. The real mirror that God is talking about here is his word and it's ever promised. So when he says, would you say to this mountain, be thou removed and cast into the sea? What this is meaning as you say, you, whatever it is that you're facing, and you cast it, you be cast into the sea. It's so important for you to begin to speak the word of God because you're throwing that obstacle, that hindrance, that disease, that sickness, that poverty, whatever it is that's hindering you, you are casting that into the, into the sea of God's promises because all of his promises are yes and amen. Amen? I hope somebody's getting something out of this. But I'm getting, I, I am, hallelujah, I know you are. Uh, and get this, he's actually saying and does not doubt in his heart. Well, here's my take on that. You remember the, the father that come with the demon-possessed boy? And he said, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. That was some doubt there. You can overcome doubt by your faith. And here's the thing. If it didn't work the first time, you keep on speaking the word until it works. I don't care if it takes 14 times or 7 times, 70 times. You keep faithful standing on the word of God and keep speaking the word of God to that mountain and I'll guarantee you it will be removed. Because see, when you speak the word, it not only does what it is sent and it will perform to do, but it also will encourage and build you up in your most holy faith. And Jesus said, but believes that those things which he says, there the spoken word is again, will be done, will have whatever he says. He will have whatever he says. He will have whatever he says. He will have whatever he says. And some people believe just because you said it one time and it didn't happen, then God must be against you or you miss God somehow. But my take on this is this. You keep speaking faith and speaking God's word until you are in his presence, my friend. You don't ever quit and you don't ever give up on anybody. I say therefore to you whatsoever things you ask when you pray. So is prayer important to, to save people and to warn people and to pray for unsaved people or people that's lost their way? Absolutely. When you pray, you believe that you receive them, whatever you're praying for. And I'm thinking here also God's talking about people like we're in that valley of dry bones. Because it's also for other people. And you will have them, whatever the promises are 
you will have them. You receive that tonight, say amen. amen. Now, I want to get in to a little bit of this Wednesday night, how to live the overcoming life and how do you become the, the image of Jesus. How do, how do you really become? Well, Pastor, I thought I already was. But d- can somebody pick you out of a crowd and say, you know, uh, some people, <clears throat> I remember when I preached at Winston County Jail, 23 years, is I never told anybody uh, where I went to church. Well, I did at one time. I'm sorry. I take that back, but I didn't for a long time because people asked me. They wanted to know when I get out of prison or get out of jail where they could come to church, and we've had some of them come here. Of course, they've gone on other places, and some of them went back to jail, unfortunately. But I never told anybody that I was anything other than never told anybody what kind of church that Solid Rock was in Haleville, Alabama, next to Gore's Big Star, because that's what I told them. That's where you can come. Never told them anything about my life other than I was a follower of Jesus. But when I came into that jail, everybody identified me as uh, I'm that extreme religious person. And I took it as a compliment. And also, uh, it was said of me, and I never said this about myself, here comes that Pentecostal preacher. And see, it, you know, and I never had to tell people after a little while to have a seat and sit down. I'm about to give you what God is saying. They just did, you know. But here comes that Pentecostal preacher. That man will pray for you. That, that man will tell you the truth, even though it hurts you. And I had a great 23 years there. It was amazing. I don't have time to tell you all of that. But here's the thing. Who do you identify with? Are you, are you, the Bible says that we are the image of Jesus, that we are being conformed into the image of Jesus. But it's so important for us to see ourselves that way every day. How you see yourself every day determines how you live that day. Amen? If you get up and it's dark and gloomy, what do you say? Man, I want to go back to bed and pull the covers over my head. It's just dark and gloomy. But I have to say, and on my prayer walk, I do this, right behind my brother and sister-in-law's house. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. And God, I'm thankful because that is the will of God for you to be thankful in all things. Did you know the Bible says that? Some people ask you, what's the will of God? And then you just tell them the word of God says in Thessalonians uh, that the will of God is for you to be thankful in all things. Amen? That does not mean you have to be uh, thankful of every bad thing that happens in this life, but you need to maintain a thankful heart going through that because Jesus will absolutely take you through that. So i got a question for you, and I'm going to try to end tonight about 10 minutes till. Here's a question. You know that, I'm going to set you up for this, you know that you're saved and you're spirit-filled and sealed, and I believe everybody in this place tonight is that way, and I'm seeing head shake. Yes, sir, that's true. And you know that you have the fruit of the Spirit all nine. We all agree with that. If you've been born again, you've got nine fruit of the Spirit. You also have nine spiritual gifts, unlike some teachings say. But you have nine spiritual gifts of the Spirit as well because the main gift you got was the Holy Spirit. And at any time you need one of the gifts, the Holy Spirit will call on you to operate in that gift, but you have to obey the Spirit to be able to operate in that gift. So you don't just have one or two or three. You have all nine because you've got the main gift, and that is the Holy Spirit. So then the question from you to me would be, are you telling me that I can cultivate and grow the fruit of the Spirit to grow more fruit in my life? And is this God's purpose for me? And that's a big resounding yes. That is God's purpose for you and I to grow much fruit, Jesus said. So how do you cultivate and grow the fruit of the Spirit more even though you've got the fruit of the Spirit? Cultivate is defined as to prepare and use to break up soil for sowing or planting to raise up and grow, develop, to maintain, to acquire as quality As the image of Jesus, to improve, develop, win, serve, and worship. That's a lot 
of words. But it tells us the truth of how that we can cultivate and grow more. Listen, a person that has a worshiping heart, that has faith, it believes, and they have a heart to serve, they're going to grow some big fruit. Amen? You just are. So how do you cultivate the fruit and live the overcoming life? You keep in step with the Holy Spirit by staying faithful in the Word and doing what it says. It's not out of sight, out of mind, falling out somewhere and having a vision. No, the Word of God, let me, let me, let me get into this in Galatians 5 and 16. The Apostle Paul is talking to the Galatian Christians here, and he says, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So is the flesh a problem to Christians? Absolutely. It's the biggest problem with Christians. It's not the devil, because Jesus said in Luke 10 and 19, I've given you all authority and power over the evil one over the demonic, over uh, the word says scorpions, serpents, and things like that, and over all the power of the enemy. So, and nothing by any means will hurt you. But the flesh is something uh, that is going to, that we have to crucify daily. It, 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 it wants to try to, the devil wants to use our flesh, if we don't crucify it, to draw us back into a dead life. So, you keep in step with the Spirit by staying faithful to the Word of God and doing what it says. So if you want to know, and it's not my opinion, this is not my opinion, it's not my teaching, this is the truth of the Word of God. If you want to walk in the Spirit, then you keep in step with the Spirit and you read the Word of God, do what it says. That is the walk of the Spirit. And then Paul goes on to say in verse 17 of Galatians 5, For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary. These are, that means it's a Greek word that means they're opposite. It's host, they're hostile to each other, and they're adversarial. They hate one another. The spirit and the flesh cannot coexist. Uh, and Paul says, if it does... You can't do the things that you really want to do as a believer, follower of Jesus, and you will not live the overcoming life. But then he says in verse 18, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Whole different subject here. And I want to use this one verse of Scripture here. When I was studying today, I inserted this one as well in my notes. You are, if you are led by the Spirit, then you're going to walk with the Spirit by reading of the Spirit in God's Word, which is Spirit, and it's life, and you're going to do what it says by the best of your ability. Then Paul is saying if you're then led, then you're walking by the Spirit, then you're not under the law because the law condemned. Does anybody remember that? And we couldn't do it. We just couldn't. Nobody could do it. That's why Jesus came. That's why the crucifixion of Jesus was necessary. That's what the blood of Jesus is for. That's what the gospel is about. Because the Word of God says in Romans 8, 2, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. See, there's another law. There's a law of sin and death that kills, but the law is still perfect because it tells us of the nature of a holy God in whom we serve. So it's good. It's perfect. There's nothing wrong with the law. We just can't live that way because the Bible says if we're guilty of one trying to obey those 613 commands, not just the big 10, but 613, then we miss one. We're guilty of them all. But Jesus, what he did, he brought the spirit of life in Christ when he was resurrected of the dead and now he's made you and I free, free, totally free from the law of sin and death. And Paul goes on to say in the book of Romans, then shall we sin because we are free from the law? Absolutely not. We don't. But because we've been made free by the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, in order to make you want to walk and live a holy life. Can somebody say Amen. 
I got three minutes. In Galatians 5 and 19, it says this, and this is important for us to identify, because years ago I'd just read this and it kind of just go in and then it was out and then I'd got it done, but I didn't really have understanding. You see, to, to seek wisdom and understanding and get these gold nuggets from God's Word is life-giving to you and I. So we need to identify the works of the flesh, and also the fruit of the Spirit. And what does it really mean for believer followers of Jesus? And now Paul says in verse 19 of Galatians 5, now the works of the flesh are evident. They're evident. It's not hard to figure it out, which are adultery. Now, for clarity and understanding, we'll define the works of the flesh. So adultery, let's be clear. Adultery, most of you know this, but some out there may not know this. They may have never heard this before. Adultery is sexual relations between a married person and a person who is not his or her spouse. That's adultery. And then he said the, another work of the flesh is fornication. Fornication. Remember, the reason we're identifying this is because people are not going to live by the spirit of life in Christ Jesus and experience the overcoming life if they're fornicating. Fornication is sexual relations between people that are not married to each other. I mean, I didn't say it. This is defined by God's Word, and this, if you've got a strong concordance, all you got to do is look this up for yourself. I didn't make this stuff up. This is the Greek meaning of fornication. And then Paul says another work of the flesh is uncleanness. What does this mean? It's filth in a natural or physical sense, especially addressing moral, a moral life of uncleanness, which is any unnatural pollution acted out by oneself or another person. So it's being amoral. You have no morals. It's not just being nasty and not being a good steward of the body that Jesus has given us. And it's not just about keeping a clean house, men and women, but it's about having good moral standards by the, according to the Word of God. And then he says, lewdness. And the King James Version says, lasciviousness. I like that, lasciviousness. But when I heard preachers preach that, I didn't have a clue what that was. It was just a big word I couldn't pronounce. So lasciviousness, which is lewdness, and lewdness or lasciviousness is excessive wantonness with a readiness for all pleasure with no restraints, unmanageable forwardness, wasteful and riotous living. In other words, a person has lost their conscience or their conscience has been seared when this happens. And then the next, and I'll need to end here, Galatians 5.20, idolatry, another form of the flesh, is image worship and placing anything or anyone before God. Sorcery is the practice, listen to me, listen to me, especially you out there in, in Facebook land and tell your friends and family members because there's so much drug addiction in our county. Sorcery is the practice of witchcraft and which is where we get the word pharmakia, which is our English word pharmacy referring to the use of and abuse of illegal mind-altering drugs or abusing prescription drugs. Hatred is another work of the flesh. is hostility toward another person. Contentions is to bring contention, strife, quarreling with others and debating uh, that causes strife, especially among brothers and sisters. Jealousies is to be envious of another person. Outburst of wrath is a, an anger that turns into fierceness to bring harm to another person. And selfish ambition simply defined means, and I will end with this, this is a work of the flesh. And Paul is talking to Christians here. Selfish ambition simply defined means your ambitions in life are all about you. Your ambitions are all about you. It's focused only on you and all your wants. Fleshly pride is the root 
cause of it. And the Bible says in Proverbs 16, 18, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Amen? Amen? Now, this was not to build you up at first and then tear you down. This is to give you truth and see what's on the inside and how that you can grow. And next session, we're going to get in to the fruit of the Spirit. And what really is it? What is the nine fruit? How do you define it by the Word of God and how that you can grow it? Amen? Amen. So, for the next few minutes, is there any questions or comments? Anybody get anything out of this tonight? I hope you did. Yes, you may. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, testimony that involves me. You recall that several weeks ago, you and I went to see a man named Ron who was 80 years old. He was using a motorized wheelchair to get around. Yep. He had dysentery so bad that he could not keep anything in his body. And can I back up a minute? My church background is in non-Pentecostal non churches. So in that respect, we never had any laying on of hands. But the Spirit said to me, get Brother Benny and go see Ron. And we did, and we laid hands on Ron and prayed the stripes of Jesus to his healing. And I talked with him a day or so later, and it said it took 24 hours for the dysentery to go completely away. But now, this man was using a motorized wheelchair. Yeah. He had put a hospital bed in his house that he could go from the wheelchair to the hospital bed, and he literally could not walk at all. And yesterday, he took a, head a weed eater and went out and weed eated it in his yard. <laughs> and I'm just saying that this is, this is a spirit at work with a person like me who never understood what it said in James or never took it to heart to call the elders, lay hands on and pray the, pray the spirit over. But he's... He's getting around just fine now, and he's in great shape. That's a miracle because, I mean, he had, you know, sickness, disease, and just it was like uh, I got the impression that just about everybody, including himself, was give up. He was dying. He was actually got dying. And he's actually, uh, I don't want to call his name on Facebook out, but he's actually a neighbor of ours. He just lives up the road and. Brother Larry can tell you, uh, Bradley, y'all will know who this person is. I know you will know him. But it was absolutely a miracle working power. But see, when we hear stories like this, I remember a past pastor of mine, praise God. You know, we hear stories like this, and then it's like, oh, okay, you know, and we let it go. And maybe you don't. And, you know, because I've been guilty of that. But when you, when you, God uses you in something like that, which he wants to use every one of you. See, it's not just a pastor. It's not just a, an apostle or a prophet or an evangelist. God wants to use each and every one. And that's why I'm so impressed with Brother Larry Gravely. It's like, Lord, when the Spirit speaks to him, he just goes. He don't care. He just goes. And I tell you, he's not ashamed to offend anybody, and he's not ashamed to pray for somebody, and he's not ashamed to, to give the gospel to somebody and to lead them to Jesus Christ. He calls me about people that he does that with. And see, he don't claim to be anything other than a follower of Jesus Christ. And they, see, that's for all of us. It's not just for pastors. It's for each and every one. I'm done. Amen. Give the Lord some praise for Ron's healing. Amen. That is a miracle of God. And see, if God would do that for him, would he not do that for you or one of your loved ones? Well, I don't know, Pastor. We prayed for somebody and they died. Well, my take on that is this. Well, then you just keep praying. You pray they got their healing. You just keep praying. Well, that's a cop-out. No, it's not because the ultimate in life is when we part this life to be in the presence of Jesus. So you pray for somebody else. And the next one may be that miracle that you get to see. Amen?
Would you stand to your feet? We'll go home on this rainy night in Georgia. <clears throat> I said that for the sake of Sister Susan. Amen. Amen. Ah. Brother Alec, would you close us out in prayer? Lord, we just thank you uh, for this time tonight and uh, just the, the, the word of wisdom that was released, Lord. And I pray that uh, just starting now and uh, into the night, Lord, just, just reveal the deeper truths in all of this. Lord, just reveal your deep revelation to yes, us. Lord. We just ask for more revelation and yes. supernatural wisdom. And, uh, Lord, we just pray for blessing over everybody in this room and that you'd keep us uh, safe on our travels yes. home tonight. In Jesus' name, yes, amen. Lord. God bless you, and I will see you Sunday. We're going to have a wonderful Mother's Day. So I want you to be here, all you mamas and grandmas and grannies. All you granny. Hey, granny, I want you to be here, granny. <laughs> Y'all have a great night. Love you, and goodbye to you on Facebook. See you Sunday.